So everybody's going to have a little brain because they eat nothing but plants. Meat-based diets, for example, because they seem to be very health-promoting and uh, highly nutritious. Hey everybody, this is Klaus from Plant-Based News uh, with uh, Senior Social Media Manager Daryl. So what's the, the word on the street on social media this week? So we've just stumbled across a video on YouTube which is titled The Best Argument Against Veganism and it's a conversation between Joe Salatin and he's talking to Jordan Peterson. Let's just go into the clips. We hear a lot of noise about how cows are contributing to global warming, which, you know, is, a, is an idea that's really struck me as rather specious right from the beginning. Because, like, did the buffalo did that too. Like, yeah. I see so huge herds of grazing animals are bad for the planet. That strikes me as highly unlikely. So, and I know they talk about methane, but you know, people talk well, about a lot of things. Now, you you said that you you regenerated the gr gr ground with the cattle mm -hmm. and with the careful management of grass, and now you're producing, say, a foot of topsoil on top of this um, rock. Rock, and I presume that's also a carbon sink. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Right. Because carb plants it, it, take in yeah. carbon because they're yeah. like made it, it, out of carbon, and because carbon it, 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 is life based. Or life, based. life is carbon yeah, based. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. I do think the main point they're making is that uh, regenerative meat is good for the soil, and there are actually many studies that dispute that. Uh, it's a similar argument that a regenerative meat proponent made when I was at COP twenty eight. Um, so I actually want to pull up one of the one of the clips from that debate, uh, the end of twenty twenty three, because it's a similar line of line of thinking. And if you advocate for soil, like I do, a large part of the world, soil requires animal integration. So that's the, that's the, the nuance, if you will, that we try to make. There was an interesting research paper in 2017 from the University of Oxford called Grazed and Confused. It showed that while certain grazing management systems can sequester carbon, this only amounts to around 20 to 60% of the emissions the animals produce in the first place. So how is this system sustainable? Well, well, first of all, um, this system replicates. The whole point of this system is to replicate the type of herd behavior that created the grasslands in the first place. So, so it's important if you're, if you're studying um, you know, animal agriculture that you make the distinction between a traditional system um, and a and a system which is which is actually you know replicating the animal movements which made grasslands in the first place, which se which sequestered you know hundreds of billions of tons of carbon were sequestered in grasslands over the evolution of grasslands and ecosystems. So it's important that you're looking at the right type, and that right type has to be expanded. Now, in regards to that particular study, um, that study was flawed. There were many papers. Um, that that study did not um, um, include in its analysis, which were available at the time. For example, that paper came out in 2017 and it completely ignored Teague 2016. Um, and and there, were other, there were other papers that the Grazed and Confused paper ignored. So I honestly think it was a flawed study and had it been done properly, its, its uh, conclusions would have been different. Same Your thing, so. experience on the farm was that carefully managed grazing herds yes. regenerated soil that, well, not even soil, they, they actually made rocky areas yes. into soil that yes. could then be, well, first of all, a carbon sink, if you care about such yeah. things, but also productive grazing land. Yes, yes. And, and a big part of the trick there is to manage the grass properly right. Right. and to move the cattle. You rotate the cattle around your through the use of paddocks around your land, you maximize the amount of product that your grasslands are producing so that that's hyper-efficient. You regenerate the soil so it gets thicker. That sequesters carbon. You produce high-quality meat, and you can do that profitably while you're pursuing a lifestyle that's enjoyable and serving a dedicated and committed customer base. Well, there's definitely a committed customer base, that's for sure. There's definitely uh, loads of people that want this stuff, right? But not, not enough land to uh, feed everyone in that way. Yeah, I mean, the statistic that really gets me is uh, one by the University of Oxford. It found that 26% of farmland currently 
um, is extensive livestock farming. So it's sort of like more towards what these guys are promoting. 26% let that sink in. That's a huge proportion uh, of farmland. Uh, and it only produces 1% of protein. So you know, massive, massive amount of land and currently it only produces just like a tiny amount of, of sustenance, which we don't even need anyway, but that's a different argument. But going back to the environment, like if we try to increase this, this uh, strategy of farming that they're recommending we just run out of land like there's a study in in uh us that came out a few years ago said that if we go towards this system of regenerative extensive livestock farming we'd need two and a half times more land than we than we have so it just yeah it makes no sense even if these animals are good for the earth like we don't need to farm them and kill them <laughs> we can reintroduce wild populations uh to to do that job if what they're saying is is true yeah and one of the things that i discussed at cop 28 of this debate that we just played a second ago is is, is the view from these re regenerative meat proponents they actually think these food system change advocates or plant-based people are against animals and against animals being on the land but we're just saying we're against livestock we're against animals being part of a 80 billion animals being part of a production system that is ironically destroying uh wildlife is destroying uh the rainforest is destroying the oceans that's what we're against plant-based food system change advocates they want to free up land they want to rewild and replenish the land according to the university of oxford in the largest study of its kind the only way to meaningfully do that is to shift away from animal agriculture sure animals are part of ecosystems that are diverse but they're not part of a robust production system. There's an example in, uh, in the UK called NEP, and it produces meat, it's, it's regenerative, it's sustainable, but it produces such a small amount of meat. Unless we dramatically reduce the amount of meat we eat, this is just not a scalable, sustainable solution. The methane released from 1,000 cows per acre. Well, you're never gonna have 1,000 cows per acre. So, so, so where do these, where do these ideas come from then given, well, you know, cause they're, they're, we hear follow the science all the time, but then if you look into the science, first of all, there is yeah. plenty, there's a plethora of opinions, yeah. right? At minimum. Yeah. And so, and just now and then, you know, when you're looking at data, you kind of have to stand back and use your head a bit. And you start from maybe the presumption that any idea that large grazing herds are bad for the planet is to be regarded with extreme skepticism to begin with, because large grazing herds are exactly the sorts of things that the environmental types worship when they're happening naturally in Africa. So you can't have it both ways. That's right. And so I just, I've just always thought the idea that pastured animals properly pastured being bad for the planet somehow and that's as bad as equating factory farming with regenerative farming for example because right. they're not the same thing at no. all he kind of claims that when you follow the science the science doesn't stand up but then he doesn't actually back up those those claims that the science doesn't stand up and then he says when you follow the science well first of all there's a lot of opinions it's like well opinion isn't science I think he's gone from a, being a psychologist who had a field of expertise and had a, an opinion which was based on certain things he can cite. And now it's morphed into him being, a, well, he, he claims he's a media commentator. So he just commentates on anything. And uh, it's like, okay, Jordan, we get that you're a carnivore. We get that maybe in your opinion and, and your experience, carnivore has worked relatively well for your body but, you know, compared to what you were eating before. I don't know your medical history, can't dispute your experience. However, you know, pipe down <laughs> when it comes to these broader issues, because with all due respect, you don't really know what you're talking about. Again, I come back to that point that if you, as he says, step back from the science, take a broader zoomed out lens, we just don't have enough land, even if this was an economically viable system, which is not because we know that even though certain grazing management systems can sequester carbon, this only amounts to around 50 to 60% of what the animals produce in the first place. But even if that's not true, right, even if, there is an ecologically viable way to do this. There's not a practical way because we just don't have enough land. And more than that, these regenerative meat products aren't even available in supermarkets. So uh, science is dodgy, not enough land, not a viable current option. Unless the argument is we're gonna feed 99, we're gonna consume 99% less meat, then okay, we have a tiny, tiny bit of meat, then okay, it might be viable then. Otherwise, it's simply not a viable option. 
But what confuses me about people like John Peterson, this fellow he's talking to, is they're not promoting a uh, reduction in in meat consumption. So it just doesn't it just doesn't add up. I do see where uh, Ricky Gervais has, uh, I think he made a joke in the last year where he brought up that statistic. Most people on the planet don't realise that most people on the planet are destroying the planet. Most people don't realise that in my lifetime, we've wiped out 70% of all animal populations. And what's left on mass is 36% human, 60% farm animals just to feed humans, and 4% wild now. People don't realise that we have to tear down entire rainforests, the lungs of the earth just to grow grain to feed these cows to feed us meat eaters if you eat meat every day if you gave up one day a week we'd feed another hundred million people but i think people care people are, think of the, it's out of sight out of mind think of the animal that most people know their dog they love their dog they wouldn't let anyone hurt their dog and a dog is a cow is a sheep is a deer this is actually similar to another clip another point i remember from the regenerative meat proponent that i was debating cop 28 so let's go back to that clip Animal agriculture currently in its intensified form requires 83% for farmland but only provides 18, 1-8% of calories. As I said, grazing takes up 26% of the Earth's habitable land and most of the meat, as you know, that's consumed around the world is factory farmed. Over 90% in the US, over 85% in the UK. So how will there be enough land? You still haven't answered that question unless yeah you say we need to dramatically reduce the amount of meat we consume? I think that the meat production can continue at approximate the same, the, the same levels at any rate on the land that's there, but not in a factory farm situation in a, you know, in a pastured... In a Which pastured. takes up more land. Yes, it takes up more land, but but it's restoring the land. So the fact that it's taking it up isn't a problem. Not as much as just leaving it alone. No, but, but, but you see, the land... <laughs> The land is already depleted. And Klaus, there's also a couple of other clips uh, from Jordan Peterson from this YouTube video. Uh, one where he's claiming the health benefits of eating meat and another one saying that uh, if you're going to eat too many plants, then you have a smaller brain. So let's have a look. Uh, Meat-based diets, for example, because they seem to be very health-promoting and uh, highly nutritious. So everybody's going to have a little brain because they eat nothing but plants. You know, regarding the, the brain size argument, Dr. Matthew Nagra actually uh, recently put out a little clip about this, so let's insert that. He's way more experienced with a lot more expertise than us. I came across a research paper from Oxford University. What this study shows is that they've followed a group of middle-aged and elderly people over five years. They've um, noted what they eat. They've done blood tests to look at various markers and they've done brain scans at the beginning and end. So vegans in this study had the most brain atrophy, the vegetarians next and the meat eaters the least. So these are the authors of the new book, Why Vegans Have Smaller Brains. And according to them, the title of the book came from a 2008 study that apparently showed that older vegans had more brain atrophy or shrinkage compared to meat eaters. But the study didn't actually show that at all. In fact, they didn't look at people's diets like she claimed they did, and the words vegan or vegetarian aren't mentioned even once. Instead, they looked at markers of vitamin B12 status and found that those with lower levels had more brain atrophy than those with higher levels over time. And if that is, in fact, a cause and effect relationship, it's possible that it could apply to vegans who don't supplement B12 but in 2025, it's pretty common knowledge to supplement. And perhaps the cherry on top is that supplemental sources of B12 raise B12 levels more than the B12 from meat. So by their own logic, wouldn't that mean that those who supplement B12 would wind up with larger brains than those who rely on meat for B12? While you ponder that, let's see how Anthony Chafee responds. I, I, uh, I actually refer to that study, um, I'm sorry, the, the two, 2008. Do you know it? I do. Yeah. It was one that yes. I think of as 2008. Yeah. Yes, that's the, it. Yeah. yeah. So he appears to be aware of the study, but never went on to correct them about the fact that they didn't look at diet at all. But even more shocking is the fact that he said he often cites the study because I was under the impression he doesn't care about studies. You know, oh, but I have a study. Fuck your study. I don't give a right. shit. Hmm. This seems like another case of carnivores or anti-vegans citing and misrepresenting studies when they think it suits their bias, even though they're quick to throw out studies when they just don't like the results. But I guess that's a lot easier than actually critically evaluating the research. We can get all of the nutrients we need from a plant-based diet. Whether you are 100% vegan now, predominantly plant-based, or um, a meat consumer, whatever you do now in 2025, it's, it's a bit of an experiment because there's microplastics everywhere. There's everything's a bit contaminated, air pollution, every, you know, the, even the way animals are raised is not 
how it was thousands of years ago. Just everything is an experiment. So I like to go with the, the data. The data shows that the more we move towards plants, the more we move uh, away from processed foods, the healthier we're going to be. I also want to do what comes intuitively for me. I could not kill an animal my, myself. I don't have any carnivorous instincts. The idea of consuming um, intestines, brains, that just freaks me out. And there's data showing kids don't want to do that either. So science is leading me towards plant-based for health. We know that leading um, nutrition groups around the world say it's possible and viable and practicable to be 100% plant-based. Um, my intuition is leading me that way. Also, just I want to kind of, without sounding too puritanical or preachy, I want to be able to sleep at night knowing that I'm not contributing uh, to a lot of harm in the world. Obviously, we live in a very complicated world where we're never going to be we're never going to avoid harm completely. But this is the single biggest, most simple thing we can do three times a day where it's in our hands. We don't need to lobby government. It's just about saying, I actually want to boycott that industry because what they do to the cows, what they do to all these animals, this just like doesn't sit well with me. And so I think it circles back to the, the title of this video about veganism. It's not just about the health effects of plant-based diet. It's also about doing the right thing morally. Mm -hmm.